way. You don't want it to be like not safe in an insecure way, but you want it to be on edge, on fire, that kind of feeling that really, because that's what makes it one of a kind and it captures you. So I would, but first of all, before you do that, you have to know what the rules are because then you know how to bend them and sometimes break them a little bit, right? Because without rules, then it's just, it's just a mess. It's no longer, it's no longer just freedom. It's, it's actually just a mess. So I think the most important thing first is to finding out, okay, let's say a particular piece, you're playing Bach or you're playing Mozart or Mendelssohn, is to find out what the character of the composer is and what the character of the piece is. And then you can amplify those characters. That's what I would call risk. That you, that you exaggerate, almost exaggerate, I would say amplify is a better word, those characteristics so that you really make the performance on five, uh, so to speak. So, uh, because, you know, you can always add more, but where do you add more? That's the question. You don't just add more everywhere. Uh, and I was trying to say that earlier today as well. It's how do you, where, where do you push for the note? And so where do you aim for? Those are all, but those all have to come from rules as well. And then, then you can have the freedom and the sense of, okay, what, how, do you, how do you push a performance? Uh, and uh, so does that, does that kind of answer the question a little bit? Yeah. Or does yeah, that create and, another and, well, question? And, 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 <laughs> as, as musicians, sometimes it's hard for us to put ourselves out there as well as risk ourselves, and, you know, be vulnerable right. to the audience. And, and, oh yeah, incredibly. Like, and, and as a performer, like how how do you how do you deal with that? You know, how do you how do you make yourself vulnerable? Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Right, because you're you're letting a group of strangers into into your kind of world. You're especially. I mean, it's one thing to play with bravado, a piece that's just very virtuosic, and then you know you're just like ah yeah. But then sometimes it's uh, you know it requires a quiet moment, and uh, those moments are the most difficult because not only do you have to let everyone in and show that you're, you're absolutely. Sometimes it's like you know one one part that comes to mind is the the chaconne, the middle part. You know, in the beginning it starts very. Uh, to this like angelic section is like So it kind of continues and you kind of have to, it's really hard to create such a moment, uh, especially when, you know, for so many factors, if the hall's not like, you know, perfect acoustics, like in here, it's pretty hard because it's, it's, it's a funny acoustic. It's, it's kind of dry, but it's not dry. It's like really correct <laughs> as well. And that can be, that can make you feel even more naked because you're just like, <laughs> and then, um, though it's not sounding like how I wanted to, but but uh, I think that, that there's, uh, you know, one thing I learned was that there's a fine line between confidence and uh, faking it, I guess. That's <laughs> really a fine line. And, uh, and, 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 you, and you can, you know, definitely on stage, one or the other, that's, you need, you need that. You need one or the other. You need something that, you need to either be confident or you need to seem like you're confident. But that definitely makes the difference in a performance. That's what, that's what elevates it because 
Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's difficult. Like when I was uh, a student, I would often try to imagine myself as somebody else. Like one of like, let's say, Yasha Heifetz or, or, uh, or Maxime Bengro or someone like David Oistra or someone who ever played the favorite recording of mine of that piece. And I'd listen to it, and then I'd try to reimagine myself as that person. Because, you know, Ray Chen might screw up, but, you know, Maxime Bangrov is not gonna screw up. So I'd be like, okay, here I go. And I'd be like, wow, yeah, I can. And then that, it's like you create this, this confidence, and then you go and you try and figure out, okay, but. In the back of your mind, you know, you know it's it, it's still you. And then once you build it up and do it enough times, you're like, but that was actually me. <laughs> and, then, and then and then and then, but you know, but then you're still not super confident in yourself. So you say, but but my next few performances, I'll just pretend that I'm Maxine Banger, or I'll just pretend that I'm Yasha Hyman's because you know those. It it just feels safer. It's way easier to pretend <coughs> to be somebody else than to be yourself sometimes. I know, that sounds awful, right? <laughs> I should be encouraging everyone to be themselves. But you will be, eventually you will be, and it's okay. Um, I think it's okay in the beginning to, to pretend that you're somebody else because it gives you the confidence, and that's what you need. Because without the confidence, you'll never wanna be yourself. Like, you'll never even wanna perform, and uh, you'll never enjoy it, and at least, by uh, you know, like kind of imagine reimagining yourself, it's okay. Like you, you'll at least be able to enjoy performances. So, and it, could you just speak uh, a little bit about how you um, came to the violin? You're growing up, and um, and what made you just decide to become a violinist? Uh, so I started violin. I grew up in. I was born in Taiwan. And I, uh, my family and I moved to Australia when I was four months old. And uh, I've been living in the States for 10 years. I moved over when I was 16. I kind of lost my Australian accent, but although I can definitely bring it out, um, this is what I sound like when I'm back at home. And uh, yeah, I mean, I lived there for 16 years. Of my life, and uh, it's, been, it's been, yeah, every time I you know, speak with my mate, from back at home, it, it's always this way. But uh, then, when I'm speaking with Americans, I like to I like to pretend I'm an American too. Because I no, honestly, it feels I feel a closer connection with the person that I'm speaking to if I'm speaking to their with them in their accent. So sometimes it'll be really funny when I'm speaking to somebody with broken English. And I'll and I'll be oh also we want to have a lunch tomorrow. <laughs> okay, lunch tomorrow. No 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 problem. Okay okay. And then, like, especially on the phone. Uh, one time one time a friend of mine walked in and I was speaking to somebody who had a really strong Italian accent. It's like alright yeah. Well we are so welcome and then you are to come to Italy yeah. And I was like oh yes I yes I come to Italy uh, no problem. Uh, 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 you speak up with me, uh, you know, we, we speak up, you know, it's like, and they were like, uh, just like, <laughs> and uh, you know, it just happens naturally. I think uh, maybe it's, maybe it's the musicians here, but anyway, um, so I grew up in Australia, and I started violin by, uh, by, you know, when I was four years old, I had a toy guitar, and then one day I decided to put the guitar in my chin and together with a chopstick, then to play this new instrument. So uh, my parents got me a violin for my fourth birthday. That was, that's how it went. And um, I did Suzuki Method in the beginning, and uh, that was really enjoyable. Uh, I did group lessons, and uh, yeah, every week we would sit in a circle, and the teacher would say, who wants to play a new piece? And I would always be one of the first who'd be like, me, me, I want to play a new piece. And I loved performing. That's where my love for performing began. Um, some might just say that I'm an incredible show off, and you know, that's fine. I, am, I guess I am, uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and uh, you know, that's uh, but I love performing, and uh, I always seeked out every opportunity I could get to play the violin in front of people, and that's what I practice for. I hate practicing, by the way, so if you hate practicing too, 
That's very normal. If you love practicing, you're just weird. <laughs> um, but I, I honestly... No, 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 yeah, wait. Oh, no, 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 oh, no. But you know what? Uh, like, 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 just just don't, don't walk away yet because practicing is important. I realize that I love performing so much that in order to perform well, I had to practice, right? I couldn't, I, I tried, trust me, I tried to not practice and still perform well. It didn't work. Uh, so that very quickly sunk in and, you know, together, I mean, every, I think every kid, every parent always asks, oh, how much did your mother or father, you know, push you to practice? And, you know, I'll be honest, without my mother, I probably would not have practiced a single second. You know, I probably would have played for like two minutes and then been like, ah, whatever. And I probably wouldn't be a violinist today. No, most definitely wouldn't be. But, uh, you know, in terms of, okay, you can't, I'm gonna lock this room and lock you in and practice. No, that didn't happen. It was more like reverse psychology. It was more like, oh, you don't wanna play a violin? You don't wanna practice? Well, it's okay, you can quit. We can save money. <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, you know, the thought of not playing violin would be so terrifying that I would immediately go and practice. So that was a much kind of healthier psychological way of getting me to practice because then it became my choice to practice, not my mother's. Um, but, you know, she was always there to remind me. Have you practiced today? <laughs> How many hours have you practiced today? Oh, no, no, you haven't practiced. Yeah, stuff like that. I mean, but it's just always, that's just how it is. You know, no, no kid is going to, like, wake up and, I, I mean, I met one kid, actually, who said she, she, like, practices an hour and a half before she goes to bed and wakes up early in the morning, practices two hours, and she's only, like, like nine years old, but I, I mean, really, that, that doesn't happen to normal people. Like, ninety-nine point nine nine percent of the population, that doesn't happen with. And um, so, if you don't like practicing, it's okay. You can still look. Look, I, I turned out all right, right? Like, it's okay. I mean, it's it's. Uh, and um, to this day, I still hate practicing. So, uh, yeah. Um. If, yeah. Oh yeah. Any questions? Can you tell us about the violin you're holding there? Oh yeah, this is a, a Stradivarius. It's uh, made in 1715, and it's uh, it's named after a very famous Hungarian violinist called Joseph Joachim. Now Joachim uh, was uh, probably in his day the you know greatest violinist. He was around the same time as Brahms, uh, who dedicated his violin concerto to, as well as Bruch, and also uh, Schumann. Schumann dedicated his violin concerto to. Uh, Mr. Joachim as well. So here I am, uh, 300 years exactly uh, after the day it was made, um, to be holding it in my hands. It's uh, quite an honor, of course, and also quite scary at the same time, because uh, I always feel slightly inadequate, and also in the back of my mind, there's always this voice that says, well, do you think that you are the best this violin has ever had. Do you, do you really think so? And, uh, you know, the answer's always like, well, do I really want to know the answer? I don't know, but that's, um, and that can be, that can be, you know, very, very troubling as well, but honestly, it also sounds pretty good, so I try, you know, it, you kind of forget all that as soon as you start playing, and what I think that I've learned also, it doesn't mean that you have to have a strat to play well. I think that, I think that it's very um, kind of an educational experience to play on one. But nowadays, I honestly enjoy. I have. I get more. I'm, it's much more fun to play a modern instrument, which I do a lot. Uh, and uh, I was talking about this last night with a few of your faculty members. And um, modern instruments today are being made. I mean, just as superbly as. Strads were back in their day. I think it's just a matter of, you know, let's wait for, th you know, 200, 300 years and we're, after they've been played and really kind of aged and let's see, let's compare them then because I think that there'll be something else. Um, I have two modern instruments that I play on a lot uh, and uh, I like to switch them around. Sometimes I don't tell people that I'm playing on my modern instrument and I go up and, you know, with professional orchestra, like I was with uh, Montreal Symphony and also in New Orleans as well. 
uh, with Louisiana Symphony this earlier this uh, last month, and you know I was playing and people come up to me and say, "Wow, your violin's amazing. What is it?" And I'll sometimes say, "Ah, oh, yes, it's my Strad," even though it wasn't. And they were like, "Oh, wow, I knew it." A special sound. <laughs> or like uh, I'll say, "Oh, it's a modern," and then they'll be like, "Wow, are you serious?" And but it just, I think it goes to show that people, most people listen with their eyes rather than with their ears. And oftentimes they'll have a preconceived notion in their minds about how a violin should sound. So I think that it's important to know that, yeah, yeah, it's important to, to, to play on a, a lot of different instruments. So you have the option of knowing what kinds of sounds are, possibilities are there, but then in the end, it's all you. Uh, you should know that, as Heifetz said, you know, when a, when a lady said, oh, you, your, your violin sounds so great. You know, funny, I don't hear anything. <laughs> and, and said that. So, so that's, that, I think that's one of the things that is, is really important and good to keep in mind. Um, any, any other questions? Oh, yes. Do you have to attach your shoulder rest? Do I have to, oh, my, my shoulder rest? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I have to attach it. It's actually glued on. So I can like take it off. And I, I made this myself, and you know you can just like put it any way you want, and uh, and it's a it's a yeah it's with a special type of glue that doesn't harm the varnish, so uh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's no, it's not a magnet because then the magnet would need the other side. I'd have to put the other side of the magnet in there, but yeah, it's sticky, so. <laughs> I guess, yeah, you know, just imagine, I, I, well, you know, never mind, don't imagine anything. Um, <laughs> uh, any other questions? We had one over there. Yeah. Yes? Is that my modern violin? Your mom. My mom's violin? <laughs> um, no, it's not. I, I wish it were my mother's violin, because then one day it would be mine, but it's, it's not my mother's violin. It actually belongs to a foundation in Japan called the Nippon Music Foundation. And they have like 17 of like Strads and Del Jesus. And uh, yeah, they, they, they've loaned it to me. I've been fortunate enough that when you, uh, the, you know, I mean, loaned is not like I pay for it. I mean, they, they just have scouted me out and, and said, here, you can use this instrument. And uh, we'll pay for the uh, insurance, which can be, I mean, quite hefty. The insurance alone can be anywhere between fifteen to twenty thousand dollars every year, and so that's yeah, that can become quite a burden as well. Um, so yeah, but luckily it's all it's all covered by the foundation. So yeah, pretty pretty lucky for that. There's, there's one more question. Yes. Hi. Hi. <laughs> What do I do? Well, after I finish crying and having my ice cream, <laughs> I, uh, well, I kind of, I kind of think to myself, okay, what, you know, I, you immediately, you always keep thinking, you can't stop thinking about what went wrong, right? It's always, that's always what happens after a performance that you're not satisfied with. And uh, for me, it's, it's exactly the same. It's no different. I kind of actually start practicing and I cover those moments that I should have or I think I could have uh, not missed and uh, yeah I'll just practice that and hope for the best the next time but it's important to really tackle those moments immediately so that they don't become a psychological barrier in your mind so when you mess up a passage in a performance it's usually because you somewhere in your practicing you created this seed I, I believe this is you created a seed of this 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 thing that made it and it grew into you might not have noticed it but it's like a weed and it just grows into this this thing that trips you over sometimes or sometimes you might not be tripped over but it's usually due to bad practicing so when you practice, you have to be sure that every moment you're focused, that you're actually practicing for the performance. Because if you're not, 
Like, think about the way you practice. You're probably at home in your pajamas, in your room, like, in, you know, the floor's carpet. You're not wearing shoes or something like that. And you're just practicing. Your mind might be, like, strolling around or something like that. Right? And you're walking around and you're practicing. Or you might be sitting down. Suddenly, you're performing. It's a completely different environment. It's not your bedroom anymore. You're no longer in your pajamas. You're wearing, you know, for, for girls, a pretty dress. For guys, might be even wearing a jacket. You're constrained. You're, you know, the air conditioning's on full blast. Or maybe there's no air conditioning and it's in summer. Um, you know, all these different factors. There's not to mention the people, the, all the strangers that are sitting in front of you, listening. Um, they're, they're nothing compared to what you practice. I mean, it's not at all the same environment. So it's normal that suddenly when you think, oh, why did my practicing go out the window? Well, it's because you didn't actually practice for that situation. You practiced for a whole other situation. So you have to, what I encourage is what people do is find performance opportunities. Try to emulate, try to copy that situation and try to recreate that in a similar situation in ho at home or go to uh, you know, a school, your school where you can pra practice in a, in a large room setting at least. So to narrow down the differences that are going to occur between your normal practicing and your performances. Because most students, let's face it, don't have that many performance opportunities. Um, but I certainly didn't. But you have to try and find as many as you can. And competitions are the same thing. You know, they're, I see them as performance opportunities. Uh, you know, of course, it's disappointing when you don't win, but honestly, it's more important to me, I, and I think it's more important for people to to have each round to go through, each round that each kind of stage, each competition you do is another performance opportunity that is going to make you less nervous. Uh, this, you know, so let's say you play in front of 200 people. Suddenly when you play in front of 50 people, it's not that bad. And when you play in front of 20 people, it's like nothing because you've already had that experience. And in your mind, you think, oh, well, this is, this is totally okay. I can handle this. And that's important. Oh, so, so, so doing that, creating those opportunities for yourself and not immediately saying, oh, no, 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 I'm not ready. It doesn't matter. Just, just go for it. That's what I always think. And that's what people mean by just go for the experience of the competition. Uh, yes? Do you practice slowly? Do, Do I practice, practice slowly? slowly? Yeah. Yes, but more importantly, I practice, let's say, a particular passage, like, or, or a, I think most people like to run through the pieces, and that's bad, that's really bad, that's probably the worst thing you can possibly do, because by, I, I mean, unless you're about to perform, if you run through the piece, if you're about to perform, then you run through the piece, that's okay, um, but if you're, or, or at the end of your practicing day, you run through the piece, but individual practicing, and I know, and you guys like, maybe for quartet it's different, but I know for individual practicing, it's, it, you, you, you gotta, you gotta, you actually have to practice in a micro-managed way. So you, let's say, uh, I don't know, a really difficult passage, I haven't played this in a while, so it's, um, and then the second variation is really hard. Okay, so there, I screwed up. That's good. That's what I needed. So I, I messed up there. So I think, okay, why did I why did I mess up? So I practice that. That's my version of practicing slowly. And then I do it again. Um, and so... Uh, okay. Oh. So that's the problem right there. I quickly create an anchor in my brain for which note to aim for. 
I'm going to choose this note. And then I know that I'm shifting after that note. So I'll, I'll practice that. I know that I have to cross over there and my pinky on my left hand is a little bit thin. So it's hard for me to cross over. So now it's this note, um, the C sharp. I'll create another anchor there so that I aim for that note as well. There we go. I'll create three anchors there. That's fine. And then I'll just run it again just to make sure. So that's how I would practice a session like that. So you have to, so, so obviously you have to practice making like anchors like that and um, in, your, in your mind, the, the, the more you practice, the more focus you have, right? So the more anchors you can, you can, you can have in your mind um, and the less you're going to forget. So, so, but it's, that, that means it's, it, it, it's important because it means that I'm not focusing on every single note individually. That's impossible. That, that would be downright silly. But instead, I'm focusing on what to aim for. Like that, like each one. Here, 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 here. Like that. And then that's how I would practice it. Um, or a shift between two notes. Um, I don't know. Mm. Like that. I would create an anchor there. So I actually create an anchor in between the note. I think it's harder to create anchors when you do an underslide. So, in, so, so for those you just have to, but those you don't really need one because you kind of slide into it. It's kind of like doing a, like, a, like if you play soccer, you know, like a tackle slide. Oh. So I forgot about my anchor just now because I was like too busy talking and I like too busy, like I was distracted. So that's not good. So I have to, okay, go back and think about my anchor again. This time, like I made a special effort right as I was about to hit that note to think about the anchor. So it's like that. You you have to, you actually have to consciously think about stuff like that when you play, and of course think about a million other things. Like, um, but usually, usually though, it's 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 all right because you have other things to help you too. You that that's just using your mind and and a fraction of your muscle memory. Of course, you can just go. Okay, okay, and then just keep doing it over and over again. I think that's what most um, students do, is they'll just keep doing it again and again and again. And then, you know, eight, if, you, if you're really talented, if you're talented, eight out of 10 times you're gonna get it. Not if you're super talented, nine out of 10 times. But it's never, I mean, you wanna decrease the odds of you missing it, right? And increase the odds of you getting it. So the more, tricks you have to making, ensuring that. It's like having extra insurance for the note. So now I have like, I'm, I might have a 99.99% hit rate of that note instead of a 90%. So that's, that's just all these things that, that you kind of, I, I mean, those two are the main ones that I use. I use I use uh, also refresh a lot as well. 
refresh is what, what I call when you're playing a per perpetual passage. So. <laughs> But what I'm doing is I'm refreshing. It's like hitting F5 on your keyboard, or F4 is it? I can't remember. Um, but you refresh your mind so that you don't get tongue twisted. So you go. I go. Refresh. Refresh. There was a refresh there. I'll stomp my foot every single time I re refresh. I should have refreshed there. See, like that's that's the kind of thing because I'm trying to think. Oh, should I refresh or not? But usually it's safer to refresh a lot because my CPU doesn't have a lot of memory <laughs> and I can't handle too much like for too long an extended period. Yes. Have you ever tried to do the original going on that? Because I'm oh. playing it too. I can't. But okay, like, why would you want to do the original bow? I mean, whatever, something like that, right? But, but I mean, honestly, who are you? Who are you trying to impress? Does your girlfriend play violin? No. <laughs> so, so, so what does it matter? It's the girl you're chasing playing violin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she plays piano. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, maybe you should learn the piano version of that bowing, and then she would be like, oh, well, that's something, because nobody's got... Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> because, I mean, the, that, that kind of thing, it's much... There's, there's so many violinistic things that are impressive. You know what's so impressive to people when they think about um, violin? It's repeated notes. When you when you like think about like in jazz, it's like, <laughs> and the people are like, <laughs> and it's like the easiest lick, and people are like, oh yeah, that's so cool. Or like when when you do, um, it's all about like, oh I don't know, like. Uh, and like, think about the charts, Monty, right? When you, the... the... Like, like, if you play it like that, it's like, okay, but if you play... and like, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah! I'm fire! And stuff like that. That's like, I think that's more exciting than like trying to do like... <laughs> that just sounds, that sounds like... I, never mind. That just, like, <laughs> that just, I mean, I don't know. It's, I think I would be much more impressed by... <laughs> It's just much more engaging. Mm -hmm. So you got to think about the musical sacrifice you have to make in order to make a Boeing that maybe two people in the audience will be impressed by. And, you know, will definitely make it a much more stressful performance for you. And you might mess up because of that. So. You wouldn't mess up. <laughs> Whoa, well, mess this one, pants. Come on the stage and let's see it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but, but you know, I, I, I know that I would definitely pee my pants if I knew that I was going to do that. And then, 
I would probably mess up really badly in the middle, and that would cause me to be in such a bad mood that I would totally just screw up my arpeggios at the end. I'd be like... <laughs> I'd be like totally like that because, and I'd just go home and cry and have my ice cream. I mean, <laughs> nobody wants that. This is just, I don't want that either. So, and so you know, I just wouldn't do it. But, but good luck. <laughs> I hope you get that girl. I hope she's really impressed. Let me know about it. Write to me on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's see you.